He said, this is man. And man is like grass. Uh, man is going to wither. Man is going to fade. Even the things that he makes are going to pass out of existence. We know that all this is going to burn one day. He said, so I want you to see man. I want you to see what he's capable of. And, and you know, there is a, a sacredness to every life. Well, we, our church has been saving and planning for uh, several years since the Lord has given us this property here. Um, and we're really, it's just been amazing how the Lord has provided for us. You know, this time last year, we actually uh, closed the pavilion. This used to be an open air pavilion. And we worked on it last year and we made the tabernacle out of it. And the Lord has been so good to us. We don't have any Sunday school rooms. And of course, uh, we don't have any Sunday school right now because of that. Uh, but we have been planning this new building to go right where the cars are sitting right now, right in that gravel parking lot right there. And the grass beyond will be, Lord willing, within hopefully by the end of uh, November, that will be uh, a gravel parking lot, the whole thing. And uh, then hopefully, Lord willing, in the spring of the year, we'll be laying the foundation for the new church building here. Amen. So we're going to have a groundbreaking uh, service, and I don't think I've ever done that before. <clears throat> so if we make mistakes... Please forgive us, uh, but we're going to ask our, our trustees to join us and the whole congregation uh, just on the grass there on the other side of the cars right after the service. It'll be very, very brief, maybe 10 minutes, something like that, and we'll have a special prayer, and uh, we've got golden shovels and everything. So we're going to take some photographs, and we'll be sending that to the Southern Standard. They're going to do a little article on that, hopefully this week. And so, uh, so stay behind, come down, get your photograph taken with us, and we'll rejoice in what God is doing and as we look it forward in faith uh, to his provision for our new building. Now, you know, it's a whole process, and it's a long, as you can imagine, drawn-out process. We, when we first started, we said it's like eating an elephant. Well, how do you eat, eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So that's what we're doing. Now, there's someone here this morning who's very uh, special to us, uh, Brother Gary Sizey. We have known for years and years, and he's driven a long way to be with us here this morning. Brother Gizzi, Brother uh, Sizi, if you come, please, uh, to the platform this morning. Uh, just come up here for just a little moment. <clears throat> um, uh, actually, at, at the funeral, but Miss Laurie's dad passed away, and he was a member of Franklin Road. And Brother Sizi was a member of Franklin Road for a long period of time, and he kind of ambushed me at that, at that service, and he said, you know, I hear you're building a building. I said, we are. He says... Brother, Brother says he is a wonderful architect and been doing it and building church buildings for years and years and years. And he says, you know, um, he says, I'd like to offer my services for free. Well, any time a pastor hears the word free, you've got his attention. And, and Brother says, not only has he helped us to draw the buildings, but, you know, we had other plans and he's revised those. And it's really going to help us financially to be actually able to build the building. And so I just wanted to recognize Brother Gary this morning. Thank you so much, Brother, Amen. for your help. And that's, thank you. That's just a little token. Amen. Thank you, Brother. <clears throat> and uh, we just, just, um, we just give him a little token of our appreciation this morning for him. And we thank you very, very much, Brother Gary. Well, at this time, the Bowman family are going to come and uh, sing for us before Brother Jeff comes and preaches to us. And after they sing, the children will be dismissed to Children's Church.
eyes through the years all the heartaches all the burdens all the tears but do not be discouraged there's a purpose there's a plan there's a reason for each trial so try that is it's good to think about isn't it and what we do for the Lord is not in vain and really what will matter a hundred years from now where will you be a hundred years from now that's important and what will matter a hundred years from now and what we do for the Lord is not in vain thank you so much ladies all right well this time we'd like to dismiss the children the children's church and my wife is back there ready for you and uh, several boys and girls not well this morning remember them in prayer uh, if you would and amen. Well, Brother Jeff has been a friend of ours for a long, long time. And you know, it's a wonderful thing when you can say that you've had friends at all, but when you've had friends for a long, long time. And you know, sometimes it's not that you have to see them, you know, every six months or whatever. You know, sometimes we don't see each other for <laughs> years and years and years. But you know, when his car pulled up at the house last night, it's just like, you know, no time has, you know, uh, went by at all. And uh, we're, we're grateful for good, godly friends. And the Lord has used Brother Jeff to start churches. He started the present church there in Indiana and uh, one in Alabama. And uh, we're very, very thankful for him and his wife for their friendship. And he's a, he's a kind soul. He's a, got a heart for people. He loves the Lord. And uh, he's been faithful all these years. And we're, we're, we're proud to call him our friend. God bless you, Brother Jeff. Well, I think a lot of your pastor and his wife, and they have uh, been uh, good friends over the years. Uh, my wife knew them better than I did in college. Tom and I lived in the same house um, years ago, 1612 Kirby, there in Chattanooga. And uh, he lived upstairs, I lived downstairs. And um, I, I didn't know much about him. I knew he was from Ireland. I knew he played the bagpipes. And uh, there's never a good time to play a bagpipe in a dorm. <laughs> but... Uh, and that's that's kind of we just we didn't know each other really well and then we bumped into each other again years later and my wife had traveled some with them i guess to some churches and ministered together and so it's kind of neat how god put us back together in each other's lives and um just enjoy that if i hang around very long i begin to talk like him i begin to say situation and you know all that and uh, so that uh i uh I, I like that kind of thing yeah, so I, i'll pick that up how many of you went to ireland with them here recently can you make me a promise, a promise, that if you go again, that you let me know soon enough that I can go with you. I'm so jealous of uh, that trip. That sounds like just a, a tremendous time and a good time there. And uh, so um, we have uh, been the last uh, several, several years at church planning. Uh, I resigned the church that I was pastoring and stepped into missions work. And uh, it was adventure Christianity, adventure yes. faith, you know. And uh, don't, I don't regret any of that. 
uh, is I thought I was a man of faith. I really did. And uh, I had, I, I think, where, where do all these missionaries get these stories? And God get, has given me some stories. <laughs> and so God has provided for us. And we've been at uh, Columbus for the last 11 years. I hope that's the place that, uh, I, I hope it's my last place. I, I, I love the, there. I love being there. I love what God is doing there. And we started from scratch. We started from nothing. And so 50 years ago, somebody, uh, I thought it was Brother Tom, he, he didn't found the church 50 years ago, uh, but uh, uh, somebody came here. Somebody started. Somebody began. Somebody took a step, a move. And you are enjoying the benefits of what somebody, a people, a group of people that gathered there 50 years ago. And so we're celebrating that today. It is a look backward. People that began and did things, that, that they started things and began things and paid for things and bought things and sacrificed for things that they were never going to really use to the full. That's right. And so you're reaping the benefits of that today. And, and in many ways, uh, today is not just to look back, but it's a look forward. And you are beginning things right. that some of you, you may not fully enjoy the full benefits of that, but uh, you're doing it for the next generation, the people that are coming along. And so that is a visionary. That is a faith thing that you're doing. I'm impressed with that. Uh, I, I, I was here when this was just an open air thing. I love what you've done. I love the attention to detail. I love that you've done it at a high level. And that says something about you, but it says something about what you think about God, and what you think about the Lord. And so he's worth the effort. He's worth the sacrifice. And so I look forward to seeing what happens here over the next year. Um, we've had an unusual world the last two and a half years, haven't we? Yes. We, we met uh, in the church that we uh, started. We, we met in every kind of building and we met in some houses and uh, just some unusual, unusual thing. I may say more about that tonight, but just God had put us in a, uh, it was a senior center. It was not residential housing, but it was a program center. Beautiful, multi-million dollar building. God led us to that place. Very unusual situation. We got the full run of it on Sunday. We'd pull in with a trailer set up. Sunday night we'd tear down. And um, two weeks before COVID really hit, uh, we closed on a deal for a, a property. We bought a, a, an old doctor's building, a doctor's pharmacy. And um, for the next uh, two years or so, we remodeled that place. It needed a lot of extensive overhaul. And with the way the world was and just all these things, it was just a very unusual setting. So I, I kind of I feel for what you're stepping into. And there's a lot of unknown things. I know, I know Brother Tom, uh, he, his attention to these kind of things, he's going to try to work through every detail as best he can. But there's going to be some things that are come up. You're not going to know. They're going to blindside you. And God's going to give you things along the way to keep you encouraged. That's right. uh, we got in that building. And it became very obvious that it was really kind of over our head. There were going to be a need for some design changes, uh, some uh, additional, some engineering work is going to be done. And knew that we needed a, an architect, somebody to plan and design some things for us. And I, I could not find the man that I was looking for. He was the next county over. And just uh, kind of a crazy thing. I just started, I couldn't find him. So I started at the top of the list. I started in the A's with the architects in that county. I called uh, Tom Allen. And uh, Tom came over, an uh, elderly man, and he got there and he said, oh, this is good, quite a project here. And we were there in the building, maybe three or four minutes, I was showing him around. He, he turned to me, kind of spun very quickly. He said, uh, he said, who told you to call me? How'd you find me? And it was kind of like sort of aggressive kind of move there. I said, I, I told him the story. I said, I was looking for somebody else. And uh, you were at the top of the list. He said, oh, he said, Alan, hey. I said, yes, sir. He said, so nobody told you to call me? I said, no, sir. And we went around maybe another minute or so. He said, again, he said, he said no one told you to call me. I said, no, sir. I, I said, no, I, I didn't know what was going on. He said, he said well, you know we're going to do this for no charge. Wow. Amen. I, said, uh, I said, what? <laughs> he said, we're going to do this for free, which is the favorite word of every preacher, <laughs> but the word free. And I, I was just, I was emotional. This is, we're just getting out of the block. You know, we're going to cash flow this, cash flow the purchase of the building. We're going to try to cash flow the, the remodel. And I figured about, we paid 150 for the building. I thought maybe the remodel is going to be 150. 
which it wasn't. And, <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm just overwhelmed with the whole process of it all. And he said, uh, I said, why, why, why would you do this for us? We've known each other for five minutes. Why would somebody do, do that kind of work for you? And he said, uh, he looked at me and I said, he said, because of what God has done for me. And uh, he, in the process of all this, he, he'd gotten sick. And uh, he passed not long after doing the building. And I thought of one of the last things he ever did was his kindness to us. And God gave us things all along the way. You know, things would get tight. And God would give us something. Uh, somebody would give us labor. Somebody would give us material. Uh, their time. Their expertise. Just again and again and again and again. And I know. I know what you're thinking. You look at these things. You think, what would, where's the money at? Uh, we know where the money's at. Amen. We know where the money's at. So, sometimes we're looking for a guy or gal to show up that's got deep pockets. And you know, we don't. And the God will give you people like that occasionally. But we have God, God that is our resource. And when you have God as your resource, if he's, if, he's, if he's started this, if he's doing this, he will take care of it all along the way and bring you to the place. So uh, anyway, if you would turn to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40. I want to tell you more about some of the, what we did. I want you to put this in your head. We'll talk about it tonight. 80 weeks in a parking lot. I'll let you think about that a little bit. 80 weeks in a parking lot. Isaiah 40. <clears throat> and uh, they didn't make me mad about the Tennessee thing. I, I'm, I'm good with that. When we were in Chattanooga, my wife and I were just married. I delivered papers for a fellow on Saturday and Sunday. And I would listen to the Tennessee games. And those were good memories. And my wife is from Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Beeham, uh, the ham. And uh, she drug me south for a little while. Made, she made me drink the Kool-Aid. I had to drink the Kool-Aid, so it's her fault. So, but um, I think my wife and I, my wife would agree with me with this. If something happened to me, if I passed, uh, there's, there's nobody I can think of that would be a better pastor to my, to my family. And Brother Fittis, I think that much of him. Uh, if something happened to me that I was not in the ministry, this, this would be the kind of place I'd come to. And uh, I'd lock in and uh, be here. Isaiah 40, I want to preach today about the workman. The workman, you're going to need some. <laughs> uh, work, work, work till the night is falling, right? Uh, there's going to be a lot of work things. And uh, what a time. It's going, to grow, it's going to grow some of your friendships deep deep over the next few months with this. It's going to be a grand time and it's going to test your patience and all those things. I got a deacon. We were doing, we're doing demo work, which is, you're not going to have as much of that, I guess. Hopefully not. Uh, but man, that's what I'm suited for. I'm work. I'm a good with a sledgehammer. And he, he come in one day, blood just coming down his face. And he was kind of laughing. I said, what did you do? He said, this sledgehammer bounced off the wall and hit me in the face. And so pray for safety for your people, uh, especially people that shouldn't have a sledgehammer, maybe. But uh, anyway, it'd be a grand time. The workman, the workman. Here in Isaiah 40, we're looking at this. Read, read, I'm going to read maybe the first uh, few verses here. It says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand, double for all our sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert at a, a, de a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cry, cry, cry. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to cry out. It says, and he said, and he said, what shall I cry? This is the message. All flesh is grass and all that, all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth and the, the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people, the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. There's a comparison made in this chapter between man and God. 
Some people confuse their role. Some people think they're God. No. Yeah. We're men and women. We are, we are but dust. Yes. Right. Right. And so the question here that God's posing here is, he says, what can man make? What can man make? Well, we are, we're innovative people, creative people. We're hardworking people. We can be visionary people, but what can man make? And then what could God make? There's quite a difference between the two. What God can make. I can see it. I've, I've looked at some of the plans. I see it just past here. You're going you're to look out these windows and as it comes up, you're going to say, wow, what a thing. A glorious thing. You can put blood, sweat, and tears, money, all these things into that. And it could be a work of your hands, but you want it to be a work of God also. Amen. You want it to be a place that is a lighthouse to this community. Amen. A place where people hear the gospel, hear the truth, where people are helped. And I know that's your desire. Yeah. And so God's got to have his work in it. We're going to labor, but we're going to labor with him. Yes. That's the way I like that. I like it when he labors with us. Let's pray. Father, we do ask today that you'd help us. Lord, we need your help. And uh, speak to our souls. There's no way I can know the need uh, of every person in this place. But I know my need. Lord, I, I feel at home. I feel comfortable here. I feel a liberty to preach. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, take charge, Lord, of the service in a way that we hear your word clearly. That you'd speak directly to our hearts. That you would help us, Lord, to know what we should do with this message each one of us, Lord, that we'd not worry about someone around us, Lord, but that we'd take this and use it. And there may be somebody here that doesn't know Christ today. What a great day to trust Christ. Lord, there may be other people, Lord, that are away from you or struggling, uh, discouraged, Lord, that are trying to find their place in, in your plan for their life. And Lord, I pray that you'd settle it, Lord, uh, all those things, Lord, help us. That, let the miracle of the preaching, Lord, of your word, that it could help every one of us today. Lord, help us to lean in, to listen, to hear you, to apply it to our lives. And we'll thank you, Lord, for what you do. In the name of the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Did you catch that? The people was grass. I don't think he's being uh, derogatory. He's just saying that we have a shelf life. <laughs> there is an expiration date on this. And it's not very long. We know that James talks about life being a vapor. It just, just quickly, quickly passes by. I, I feel that uh, almost increasing. It's, it's going faster, it seems like. Uh, just year after year, it's ticking off like a, uh, the tenth of a mile on, a, on an odometer. Just boom, boom, boom. It's just uh, uh, going even faster. But he says in verse number nine, he says this, the last phrase there. He says, behold your God. He said, this is man. And man is like grass. Uh, man is going to wither. Man is going to fade. Even the things that he makes are going to pass out of existence. We know that all this is going to burn one day. He says, so I want you to see man. I want you to see what he's capable of. And, and you know, there is a, a sacredness to every life. We believe that. That every soul is precious, young and old. Well... Or disabled. Every group of people God values. Every one of them. But he says all that to say this. He said, behold your God. Look at God. Look at God here. There, there are two questions that are asked in verse number 18. He says, to whom then will you liken God? Who's like him? <laughs> Who? Who comes even close to him? <laughs> and obviously the answer is no one. He says here, the second question, he says, or what likeness, what likeness will you compare unto him? We are not idle people. I-D-O-L. We don't make idols. So why do we not do that? Why, why do some religions do that? But Christianity does not do that. Because you can't capture the likeness of God with a stick or a stone or some created thing. 
what every everything that you could create would be a poor copy of our God. And from these questions, we are told a little story. Look at verse number 19. It says, The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He said, He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation, chooseth a tree that will rot, will not rot, and he seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Keep your finger there, but I want you to go to chapter 44. Chapter 44, verse number 12. We kind of have a, a, a fuller version, a fuller telling of what God's talking about here. Chapter 44, verse number 12, it says, The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it with hammers. Talking about an image. Uh, uh, he's making uh, some kind of idol. And so he's worketh it with the strength of his arms, yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. He's putting time into this. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with a compass, and maketh it after the, the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, and it may, that it may remain in his house. He heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god, and worshipeth him, maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, with part thereof he eateth flesh, he roasteth roast and is satisfied yea he warmeth himself and saith aha uh, i am warm i have seen the fire and the residue what is left over thereof he maketh a god even his grave image he falleth down unto it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith deliver me for thou art my god some people are going to make a god I want you to get the picture here. This workman, he grows a tree. He strengthens the tree. He nourishes the tree. He's prepared the tree. He goes out one day. He says, it's time to cut the tree. He cuts the tree down. He carries it home. He's excited about this. The creative juices are flowing. He takes the limb off. He builds a fire to stay warm. He takes some of the wood. He, he makes a fire and makes some bread. He has some fire and he makes a roast and with the rest he said i got a little bit left over i've got some residue i got some cast off uh, he said they're there in the back and he said with the rest of that i'm going to make a god i'm going to design the thing plan the thing he planes the wood and he he he's gathering the metals that he's going to need he he's he learns to melt the gold and the silver and he's he's planning and casting the wood and it, it's hot it's tough laborious work he he's tired and some days he'll finish uh, uh some days he'll have to leave the job to uh, to finish another time so day after day day after day he's doing this he's progressing his god is taking shape he's learning he's growing his skills and he finally finishes the thing he's proud of it Sit here on the on the lectern, the, the, the pulpit here. He cares. He his he, he shows it to his friend. He said, See what I got here? His friend says, What is it? He said, Well, it's my God. It's my God. And he has used all he has to make him. Skills, ability, training, craftsmanship, attention to detail, forethought, patience, diligence. But if you could get him alone in a quiet place where we're no, maybe no one else would hear, he would tell you that there's a pile of gods behind his house that he messed up. A pile of gods that, that just weren't right. If he's honest, he'd tell you about the imperfections of even the God that he's made. I, I think I could do it better next time. The mistakes because he was tired. The mistakes because he was hungry. And I, I hurried this. And there's a flaw there in the way that only someone that created it would know. Miscues with the metal. Too hot. Too cold. 
But he will build a better God next time. It says here in Isaiah 44, verse 19, I think it is. Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? Am I going to worship a tree, a stone, a piece of metal? We'd say, surely not. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't fall for that. But we have the God of self-reliance. Yeah. Right. The God of our own labor. The God of pleasure. The God of busyness. The God of entertainment. The God of money. Gehazi was a, a workman. For his master. The man of God was there in his place of dwelling one day, and Naaman came to see him, a leper. Naaman gets healed, he goes down to the river, goes down seven times, comes up, he's clean. He's thankful. He's thankful. We ought to be thankful for what God does. He goes to the man of God, he said, I want to give you something. We don't need anything. He said, I got all this, all this silver. I got these this garments to give you, to say thank you, to, to pay you for what your God did for me. He said, no, no, no. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. He said, you go on. You worship God in your home. You thank God on your own. Gehazi is, he's mad about it. He wants it. He's serving God for what he can get. Gehazi runs after Naaman, stops him, tells a lie. Hey, my master sent me, he's changed his mind. But what made him mad was that his master turned him away. What made him, what made him, what made him glad was that Naaman said, yeah, take, take it. And I always wondered because he didn't take everything with him. But he, I think he took all that he could carry. And so he's happy now. But he gets back and he hides the stuff. He faces the man of God. And God's voice speaks through that man. He says, well, you can keep your stuff, but you'll, you'll have the leprosy of Naaman now. And there is a sadness to whatever God you choose other than the God that is God. Yeah. And so there is this toiling workman that you're trying to create something that, that God only fills that place. If it's whatever it is, whatever you... Whatever you turn to in your moments of satisfaction, whatever you turn to in your frustration, is that, is that really your God? But there is a true workman here. Look back in chapter 40, verse number 12. He told us, told us here, in verse number 9, he said, Behold your God, behold your God. And he asked these questions. I love the questions of the Lord. That God gives us. He says, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? All of them. And meted out heaven with a span. And compared, comprehendeth the dust of the earth in a measure. And weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor hath taught him. He said, who's done these things? He said, with whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment? And taught him, in, taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are as counted as a small dust of the balance. And behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. He says in verse number 16, And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. You couldn't, you couldn't gather enough to appease the Lord. He said, all nations before him are as nothing they're accounted to him less than nothing in vanity. God, God is the answer to every question in verse number 12. Who, who hath measured? Who, who is meted out? Who, who comprehends? Who, who weighs it? Who's done all this? And the question is answered every time. God, God, God. God has done that. Man's not done that. I got intrigued about mountain climbing. I've never done it. Never going to do it, to do it I don't think. I get intrigued about it. These 14,000 foot peaks, you know, to get to Everest. Takes incredible effort and money to get there. It's one of those exclusive places. If you've been to the top of Everest, you've done what many people will never do in their life. And you go, you go and you leave. You can't stay there. Man can't stay there. And God says, I'm, I've measured the thing. I've created the thing. 
Just one little thought here. This, 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 this infinitely, infinitely large universe that he made for us. The yardstick of an astronomer is a light year. Yeah, right. <clears throat> the distance light travels in one year is at 186,273 miles per second. Our sun is eight light minutes away. Sounds so close, doesn't it? <laughs> you say it like that. The closest star to us is Proxima Centauri. It's 4.24 light years away. Let's get that in something that we can understand here. If you took the Apollo 11 spacecraft that went to the moon, and if, they, if it traveled, if you traveled at the speed that it traveled to the moon, it'd take you 43,000 years to get there. That's seven times longer than man's recorded history. Hey, I'm going to Proxima Centauri. So long, never seen you yet. And that's just one star that our God made. That's the closest one to us. There's a star called Antares. It could hold, it's so big, it could hold, they say, 64 million of our suns. Whoa, that's, that's, that's incredible to me. But there's a constellation called Hercules, which is, by the way, a cool name for a constellation, I think, Hercules. There's a constellation there that has a star that co could hold 100 million stars like Antares. It's, 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 it, it just, I mean, our mind, I'm telling you, our mind can't take it all in. Right, right. Like a speck. And our God spoke it all. Yes. You know how, how it talks about it in Genesis? And he made the stars. And he made the stars. <laughs> oh, we need some stars today. Boom. And he made them. And put them in their place. Psalm 14 says in verse 147, 4, it says, He telleth the number of the stars and calleth them all by their names. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. The question here is, who has directed, who has, who, has, who has taught our God, who has been a counselor to, to him? With whom took he counsel? Who instructed him? Who taught him these things? Who showed him these things? And the answer to that question is no one. No one. Look, the things that we do, the things that we create, the things that we, we try to make, they don't impress him. Things don't impress God. We think about God as the potter in Jeremiah 18. He sits down. He's the refiner. It says in Malachi 3.3, 3, it says, and he shall sit as a refiner. This he is the true workman. There is a toiling workman that's making him a God, making him a little life, making, making him a little something that will work. But the true workman is our God. Yes. The true workman. Oh, he has skill, foresight, patience, ability, diligence, craftsmanship, the knowledge. He has, he has it all. He says in Isaiah 44, 21, he says, I have formed thee. Now think about that. This God that made this world that we live in, this universe, this, this marvelous, marvelous world, the beautiful world that he's given us. He says, you are my greatest creation. I don't feel like that sometimes. I feel weak. And I am weak without him. It says in Isaiah 44, 24, it says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. You know the tremendous work he gives? He gives, he gives a, the first chapter of Genesis this detailed account of creation, and just like... Oh, I wish you weren't moving so quick through this. I'd like to know so much more about it. But that's, 
He did all that for us. Yeah. For man. There's a tremendous work that he wants to do in us. Yeah. He says, get your eyes off of these other things. I love, I, I wish I had time. I'd tell you the story. 1 Samuel 5, the Dagon. Dagon. He's a god. Little G God. The, the pagan priest had set him up that day. They brought the ark in, and the next day, Dagon's on his floor. He had to pick him up. Imagine having to pick up your God. Oh, I'll set you back up here. Comes in the next morning, Dagon's on, Dagon, his God's on the floor again, his hands are broke off. <laughs> oh my. And we, we trust so, so foolishly these silly things that are going to help us. Our bank accounts, our education, people. Look, there is a man that makes a God. A God that cannot see, a God that cannot hear, a God that cannot move, a God that cannot think. There is a God that makes a man. Yes. Now think about that. God could make a man, and he's made a man that can hear and think and move, that has a soul. Oh my, why don't we, why don't we walk with the true workman that wants to do the tremendous work in our life? Look, there's a man that carries his God. My wife and I, first church we started, a little town in Indiana, we got door knocking one day and we come up on a porch I don't know why I don't know why I was concerned about it but there was a little statue that some people would say represented Christ I'm not a I'm not I would never have something like that you know I'm not into idols that little statue was laying over on the porch there and his feet were broke off I don't know what made me do it. I usually, if I'm on somebody's porch, I don't touch anything that belongs to them. If there, was a, uh, if there was a quarter laying in the ground, I wouldn't touch it and take it. I don't touch their stuff. But that day, I took that little representation of Christ and I stuck him in a boot so he'd be standing up. There's a man that carries his God, but there's a God that carries a man. And I'm telling you, God has carried me. God has carried me. Day after day after day after day. And God will carry this church. He'll carry this church. And he'll do a work. Oh, I can't wait to hear the stories. You're going to have stories over the next few months about God and what God did. And how, how God knit your hearts together. And how God provided and God showed. And, and just again and again. You're going to say, there are going to be times that you're going to be so weary. You say, God, I'm so full because you've given me in my time of need. Oh, there's a man that dusts off his God, but there's a God that dusts off his man. Dust us off, God. Use us, God. You know, <clears throat> one of God's prophets went to the mount, mount and battled the prophets of Baal, right? You remember the story? And fire fell. That man of God saw the rain fall, and then Jezebel threatened him. And he ran for his life. And God finds him. He's weak. He's ready to die. Just let me die. And God says, arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And Elijah goes in the strength of the Lord for 40 days off of what God gives him. Now think about that. What, the kind of work that God could do in your life that could keep you going and going and going for him. I'm not even talking... I'm not talking about physical work. I'm just talking about standing in the world that we live in. I'll tell you, there's a workman that is our God that never wearies, that is never faint, that never is so frustrated with you that he's ready to throw in the towel. He wants to build you and make you and make you. And he said, I've got, I've made such a mess of this. He said, that's, that's okay. I, I'm good at fixing the messes. I know what to do with it. I know, how to, I know how to repair it. I know how to take your life that is all messed up and straighten it all out. I've met people like you. They'll come and say, boy, I've made a mess of this. And I step back and I think, boy, they have made a mess of this. I think, how in the world do we unravel these things? 
And I've got to the place, I tell Miss, I have such confidence in the Lord. I said, I don't know how to fix this. But I know this, that if you would begin to do what God has said to do, that there's going to be leaps. There's going to be, there's going to be things that God's going to fix and you're not going to understand it. If you just begin to do those things. For somebody here today, God wants to make and he wants to begin with this thing of salvation. I don't know you folks. I don't know. I don't know who, who's here normal. I don't know who has come today that you need the Lord. You know, you're a sinner. You've come to God's house and you say, what do I do? You need to trust him yeah. as your savior. I know there's somebody here that would open up a Bible and show you how you can know. Know for sure that heaven would be your home. Have your sins washed away. Many of you would say, I'm a Christian person. I'm, I'm saved. But I've not allowed God to work. I've set up, other, I've tried to build it myself. I've made a poor job of it. What a great day to straighten it out. To start. To start anew. Start afresh. God, here it is. <laughs> Lord, it's not much. I've, I've, I've just, look at me. And God say, I, I'll take charge. I'll take over. And I want you to have confidence over you're, you're stepping into something. You're, you're about to pop the top on something. And it's exciting and scary all at the same time. What an adventure. What a bold thing to do. Yes. Praise God. Yeah. I know this. God's going to do a work. Amen. He can do a work. Yes. Let's let him do the work. Would you pray with me? We're praying. Just give you a, a chance to respond if you need to respond or want to respond. Then I'll turn it over to your preacher. Father, I pray that you'd help me. Help me today. Help these people today. Lord, help us to respond to you in a way that we'd say, Oh, dear God, work, work a work in our lives. Work a work. Let me ask you a question, folks. No one's looking. How many say, I know, I know I need to let him do the working and I've not been. I want, I want you to pray for me today. Anybody can say, Preacher, pray for me today. Yes, yes. I got eight my hands up. There's times that I've not done what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, do something with that today. Do something with that. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Help us, Lord, to, to do business with you. In Christ's name I pray. Let's all stand. Let's let her play the piano through one time. If you need to come, why don't you come? Why don't you come? The altar's open. Maybe you want to gather somebody, pull somebody aside, say, pray with me today. This is a special day, a beginning day. It's a remembering day, but it's a beginning day. Start fresh. Start fresh. Have confidence in Him. Amen.